He spotted an unidentified length of tubing at the bottom of the pool and asked his supervisor what to do. He was told to put it in his tool basket. If that supervisor worked for me, I would fire him immediately. By popular demand, we are checking out XKCD's What If. Specifically, what if he swam in a spent fuel pool? Well, I'll tell you right now, there's no lifeguard on duty. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Love the disclaimer right here. <laughs> This question comes from Jonathan, who asks, What if I took a swim in a typical spent nuclear fuel pool? Would I need to dive to actually experience a fatal amount of radiation? How long could I safely stay at the surface? Answer to the first question is yes, and you'd have to try pretty hard. And the second question, how strong of a swimmer are you? The short answer is that, assuming you're a reasonably good swimmer, you could probably tread water anywhere from 10 to 40 hours. <laughs> At that point, you'd black out from fatigue. And awesome, exactly. Drown. This is also true for a pool without nuclear fuel at the bottom. And it's not really the question Jonathan was asking. That really is the biggest hazard with associated with the spent fuel pool. It's drowning. If you're doing work near the spent fuel pool, you need to wear a life vest for that reason. Right here, they're removing a gate. Though, interestingly enough, if you're on the refueling bridge above the core when it's opened up during an outage, you don't have to because you have railings. But again, the biggest hazard is going to be the water. Spent fuel from nuclear reactors is indeed highly radioactive, and it's also hot. Water is good for both radiation shielding and for cooling, so fuel is stored at the bottom of pools for a... Spent fuel is considered the highest level of radioactive waste, but it accounts for less than 1% of it by volume. Over 90% of it is low level and can be recycled. Things like the protective clothing these guys are wearing gets dirty and they just need to do laundry. Intermediate level waste is are things like filters in reactor coolant purification loops, things that regulate water chemistry, in which is the loop that regulates water chemistry in reactor systems. Those, it's a matter of have them sit for a few days so they can decay enough and then treat them in the advanced liquid processing system. You're mainly just going to have water. And that water is tested for both radiation and for chemical toxicity. And if it's good, then it can be discharged safely. But this is the high level stuff that requires time in the spent fuel pool and eventually in dry cask storage. Couple of decades until it's inert enough to be moved into dry casks. Yeah, they got that right. We haven't really agreed on where to put spent nuclear fuel yet. Where we're at right now is they're, so they're stored safely on site, and these casks are immensely tough, can resist severe weather, even direct missile strikes, and their license is good for at least a century and those licenses can always be extended. Other proposed solutions are in underground bo boreholes or caves that are, can be geologically stable for many thousands of years. So I don't know about us not being sure. I mean, we're more sure about this than we are about waste products from any other method of generating electricity. Even the vaunted clean sources such as wind and solar, people are struggling to recycle those materials. One of these days we should probably figure that out. <laughs> Put up no swimming sign. <laughs> there are actually no swimming signs near spent fuel pools. But Jonathan asked about swimming in the pool. Here's the geometry of a typical fuel storage pool. The heat from the fuel wouldn't be a big problem. The water temperature in a fuel pool can in theory go as high as 50 degrees C, but in practice they're typically between 25 and 35 degrees. Warmer Logs are taken on spent fuel pool temperature every day. It's usually right at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that geometry is pretty good. Uh, the plant I worked at, the fuel was 14 feet long. And the federal requirement in the United States is water has to be at least 23 feet above any radioactive source. And it was actually considerably higher than that where, where I worked but that's a pretty good sketch. Better than most pools, but cooler than a hot tub. But Jonathan asked specifically about the effects of radiation. For the kinds of radiation coming off of spent nuclear fuel, every seven centimeters of water cuts the amount of radiation in half. So let's back up a bit to what type of radiation is from spent fuel. The hazard is not the uranium. You can touch fresh fuel outside of water, not shielded from water. It's got cladding, 
but and be 100% fine because uranium is just an alpha emitter very short range it will not penetrate the cladding of the fuel which are typically made out of a zirconium alloy so you're completely safe from uranium one of my first jobs was actually to inspect some of the fuel the fresh fuel as it arrived on site and all you wear are basic surgical gloves and that's mainly just so you don't get the fuel cladding dirty however after fuel has been used in the nuclear power plant, the fission products are where the most dangerous levels of radioactivity come from. Things like strontium-90, cesium-137, iodine-131, and a whole bunch of other fission products that are typically beta and gamma emitters. That is what's going to give you a high dose of radiation. And that is what they're talking about in this video. So this having in seven centimeters so the rule of thumb I'm used to for gammas is five centimeters. So this is actually being a bit conservative, but overall, so far they're doing pretty good. Absorption means that two meters away from the fuel, there's a billionth as much radiation as directly adjacent to it. And two meters farther away than that, there is a billionth again as much. You're getting very little dose unless you get very close to the assembly. The most highly radioactive fuel rods are those that are recently removed from a reactor. Based on the activity levels provided by Ontario Hydro in a report, these are the regions of danger and safety for fresh fuel rods. All true. Fresh fuel is, both, is not only the most radioactive, it's also the hottest. And the reason for that is just radioactive decay. The spent fuel fission products decay over time, so radiation and temperature levels will go down. That's not the only factor is the freshest. At the plant that I worked at, not every fuel assembly is single use. Some go into the reactor for multiple cycles. A cycle is a refueling period, typically 18 to 24 months. And in every cycle, there is a mix between fresh fuel, never been used, once burned, and twice burned. And the reason why you mix it up is to both optimize fuel efficiency and power distribution. It's important to have a relatively uniform power distribution in the core. You don't want any localized hot spots. It can just throw everything off. It's a bit like playing a game of Scrabble in how you arrange these fuel assemblies. But the most dangerous source would not only be fresh, it would also be a twice burn source. So it would have the most amount of fission products and it would be at the highest enrichment level. Highest enrichment means more fissions, more fissions also means more fission products. So be sure to look at your core map next time you want to go diving in a spent fuel pool. Swimming to the bottom, touching your elbows to a fresh fuel canister, and then immediately swimming back up could be enough to kill you. Yet Potentially, though it would be very difficult to actually do. Because, assuming no one tried to stop your crazy plan, fuel assemblies are housed in these little grooves to protect them. So you're at a very disadvantaged position, geometrically speaking, in order to absorb that much dose because you can't really get through to them. The top of the fuel assemblies are not at the tip of those racks. It's still a few feet below them. And even if they were just a few centimeters away, the amount of dose drops off rapidly. And you're not even getting the full front brunt of the dose because the, the fuel is in protective cladding too. So good luck with this crazy plan. Outside the safe dose boundary, you could swim around as long as you wanted. The dose from the rods would be less than the normal background dose of radiation you get from cosmic rays and stuff walking around. True. In fact, as long as you were underwater, you'd be shielded from most of that normal background dose as well. So you might receive a lower dose of radiation treading water in a spent fuel pool than walking around on the street. That's a good point. Now background radiation varies varies so widely depending on where you are in the world and where the biggest source of radon is and that just comes from the earth from minerals from the decay of natural uranium and thorium which you would get more dose from that than you would from the sun or cosmic rays. At least in theory. If there's corrosion in the spent fuel rod casings, there might be some fission products in the water. I certainly hope not. <laughs> there are program engineers with corrosion control programs. There's one specifically for spent fuel. There's an entire overarching spent fuel management program that looks at these sort of trends and identifies any defects way ahead of time. If there were corrosion or damage, it's actually possible to reconstitute fuel. Just think of it as putting a bundle of sticks back together with 
the highest level of oversight and regulatory bodies you have ever seen for such a task. This would all be done remotely using cranes, possibly drones, depending on the set the extent of the damage and the operators, the closest they would get would be the service, just like those two stick figures. It would, it's a very weird situation where you would put divers in the spent fuel pool. I've never seen it at my plant. Spent fuel facilities generally do a pretty good job of keeping the water clean, but it's radioactive enough that it wouldn't be legal to sell it as bottled water, which is too bad because that'd be an amazing energy drink. It's also highly acidic. Spent fuel pool water has very large amounts of boric acid in there, about 2,800 parts per million. And what boric acid does, think of it as liquid control rods. The boron in the boric acid shuts down fission reactions. So it's already impossible to have a fission reaction in a spent fuel pool because the geometry just doesn't work. The fuel assemblies are placed in a configuration that it's impossible for them to start up. But for good measure, highly borated water is used. And to get a sense of how big 2800 is in terms of reactivity control, at the beginning of a fuel cycle, a pressurized water reactor has a concentration of around 1300 or 1400 parts per million. This is giving additional shutdown margin, which is a way of saying we're not even close to beginning to remotely think about turning the spent fuel pool into a nuclear reactor. We know spent fuel pools can be safe-ish to swim in because they're routinely serviced by human divers. No, not where I worked. Remote monitoring equipment and crane operators at the surface. However, these divers do have to be careful. On August 31st, 2010, a diver was servicing the spent fuel pool at the Leibstadt nuclear reactor in Switzerland. He spotted an unidentified length of tubing at the bottom of the pool and asked his supervisor what to do. He was told to put it in his tool basket. If that supervisor worked for me, I would fire him immediately. So um, radiological safety 101 here. Stay within your defined zone of what you briefed for. This was clearly beyond the scope of his work zone. Do not grab any foreign objects that you're not sure what level of radioactivity it is because you don't you don't survey the bottom of these because you're no, no one goes in there. You can you survey the surroundings and you extrapolate. But no, you're not going to send divers in here to retrieve stuff without the highest level of radiological briefings to occur, as well as just basic water safety briefings. Which he did. Due to bubble noise in the pool, he didn't hear his radiation alarm. Uh, when no. the tool basket was lifted toward the surface, the room's radiation alarms went off. You would also have multiple radiation alarms on multiple parts of the body, because if you're getting that close to any radiation sources, the dose to your left arm could be that much different from your dose to your right leg, for instance. So you would be quite heavily monitored there would even be some radiation protection personnel that you would like call out to. They would be monitoring your position in real time because your radiation monitors will also act as a tracking device and they're measuring the dose for you. This is, this is insane. The basket was dropped back down and the diver left the pool. The diver's dosimeter badges showed that he received a higher than normal whole body dose of radiation and the dose in his right hand was extremely high. Which is why you have those individual body part dosimeters. The object turned out to be a piece of protective tubing from a radiation monitor in the reactor core, made highly radioactive oh by neutron God. flux. The tubing in question had been- So neutron flux, neutron can activate certain types of materials, uh, usually metals. And by activate, I mean neutrons bombard these metals and, can, and turn them into radioactive material. Neutron flux is only a hazard in an operating nuclear reactor, though. You're not going to receive that by um, swimming near the spent fuel. It was assembled in 2006, but a piece accidentally broke off and sank to a remote corner of the pool floor, where it sat unnoticed for four years. The tubing was so radioactive. That's also staggering for something like that to go unnoticed for four years. Spent fuel pool is the highest level of foreign material exclusion or FME zone. It is constantly monitored by cameras and has FME monitors to ensure basically people that ensure no foreign material enters this area. If you're going to work above a spent fuel pool, the FME monitor has to log all of the tools, all of the equipment that they are w wearing and using 
and everything is logged on a list. So after you finish work, they check again and make sure you brought everything with you. And that's because spent fuel is considered sensitive equipment. You don't want to have anything that can go in there that could possibly damage the fuel. Now it's pretty robust, as in you would have to try to damage spent fuel, but we are not taking any chances at all. So that's why it is under the highest level of administrative controls. And there are only, there's a whole bunch of tools that are strictly prohibited for use in the area. One of them is tie wraps because they're that easy to lose. And every tool has to be tied off to your body with a lanyard, has to be able to float, or they just don't let you in there. They even require you to put duct tape over the zippers in your protective clothing so the zipper doesn't fall in. So this was quite the cascading feel failure right here. That if the diver had tucked it into a tool belt or shoulder bag close to his body, he could have been killed. As it was, That's the water insane. protected him, and only his hand, which is a body part more resistant to radiation than the delicate internal organs, received a heavy dose. So as far as swimming... It's still possible to lose a limb. So all those silly things you see about growing extra limbs from extreme dose, you're more likely to lose one. Safety goes, the bottom line is that you'd probably be okay as long as you didn't dive to the bottom or pick up anything strange or drink too much of the water. The real real hazard is, again, the F me hazard of if you were to just jump in a spent fuel pool and bits and pieces of your clothes, your watch, jewelry, necklaces, whatever you happen to have in your pockets could fall in, risk interfering with the fuel. That is probably the biggest hazard overall, and it isn't to the person. Second biggest hazard would be drowning. But just to be sure, I got in touch with a friend of mine who works at a research reactor and asked him what he thought would happen to you if you tried to swim in their radiation containment pool. In our reactor? He thought about it for a moment. You'd die pretty quickly before reaching the water from gunshot wounds. <laughs> wow, that's pretty intense for a research reactor having armed guards. I mean, that's normal in a commercial nuclear power plant, but I guess at their research facility, they took uh, safeguards pretty seriously in terms of bad guys getting their hands on radioactive material. Now, the two research reactors I went to, they, ne they didn't have any armed personnel. But then again, that was quite a long time ago. That was overall pretty good explanation. Still can't believe that one story, though. That would never fly anywhere I've ever worked about a guy diving and picking up things on the bottom of the pool by hand. Uh-uh. But yes, you would be a lot safer than most people think. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.